Hello, I am Dr. Azaz from MedicalVisual.com and in today's visual lecture, we will talk about the structure of placenta. In last lecture, we have discussed that how the placenta develops. If you haven't watched that video, please watch that first. Otherwise, this part 2 of that series will not make any sense to you. So here we had discussed that the placenta is formed and uh, here is a cross section of placenta. And you can see that this placenta, it is connected with the fetus by the help of this umbilical cord. So fetal blood from the fetus, it goes through the umbilical arteries into the placenta. And here the exchange of material between the fetal and maternal blood occurs. And then the oxygenated and nutritious blood through the umbilical veins go back to the fetus. Now, in this visual lecture, we will focus only on this part, this cross section of placenta, and we will see that what is exactly the structure of this placenta, and uh, we will see that how it works physiologically, how it works, and in upcoming lecture, we will also see that what are the functions of placenta. So, let's zoom into this part and let's see how it works. Okay, so we should not just zoom into this part, let's try creating a placenta. So here is a branch tertiary villus and of course this is not the only branch tertiary villus here. There are numerous branch tertiary villus that make up the placenta. So let's suppose here is another neighboring branch tertiary villus and it is these villi, these are uh, surrounded by the syncytiotrophoblast. As discussed earlier, the syncytiotrophoblast have small spaces in them and we call them lacunae or lacunar spaces. These interconnected spaces, they form the lacunar network. Below this is the chorionic plate and it consists of chorionic blood vessels that go into the uh, these tertiary villi. The structure, it is embedded into the maternal endometrium and specifically which part of maternal endometrium? Yes, decidua bezalis. So it is embedded into the decidua bezalis. And of course, as this placenta, it invaded the decidua of maternal endometrium, it also invaded some of the maternal blood vessels. Specifically here, the spiral artery is shown. So as the spiral artery is invaded by this invasive syncytiotrophoblast, the blood from uh, this spiral artery, it starts to pour in into the lacunae. So now the lacunae, they are filled with the blood. Which blood? Maternal blood. This is not fetal blood, right? Then what happens that the cytotrophoblasts that were surrounding these tertiary villi, uh, these cytotrophoblasts, they proliferated, they went upward and then they fanned out like this and they formed this membrane at fetomaternal interface. This is the fetal part of placenta, this is the maternal part of placenta. At this fetomaternal interface, they formed this membrane and it is called outer trophoblastic or outer cytotrophoblastic shell. What is the function of this outer cytotrophoblastic shell? There are two functions. One that it properly anchors this fetal part with the maternal part. So in other words, we can say that it interconnects, it interdigitates the fetal and maternal part of placenta. Secondly, these trophoblastic columns, they prevent the disruption of structure of these tertiary villi. What I mean by this is that these tertiary villi, they are like immature trees. They may fall apart, they may swiggle around like this. So it properly, these trophoblastic columns, it properly anchors these, uh, these tertiary villi, these, these branches of tertiary villi as well as the complete tertiary villi as a whole. So this branch of tertiary villus that is connected with the maternal endometrium with the help of these trophoblastic columns, these branch, this one and this one, they are called, they are called anchoring villi. So what they are named as? They are named as anchoring villi. And the other one, they are, these one, they are termed as free villi because they are freely moving and they can freely swiggle around here and there within this syncytiotrophoblast. So they are called absorbing villi or free villi. They are called absorbing villi because their main function is to absorb the nutrition from this maternal blood. 
and there these villus branches their main function is to anchor the placenta so there are two types of branches of tertiary villi then what happens that this in situ trophoblast in between this lacunae and that these tertiary villus it starts degenerating it starts undergoing apoptosis and this lacunar spaces they become very wide and as these lacunar spaces they become so much wide that they form the space between two neighboring tertiary villi so that is why now the lacunae they are converted into what we call as intervillous space so here is an intervillous space and here there is another intervillous space and here is also there would be another intervillous space actually the lacunae they are the primordium of intervillous spaces right so we have been discussing only about the endometrial arteries but of course this endometrium does not only contain arteries it also contains the endometrial veins so what happens that as the maternal blood flow into this intervillous spaces and exchange of material occurs here then this blood it goes back into the maternal circulation with the help of these maternal endometrial veins then what happens that finger like processes they arise from the decidua bazalis of maternal endometrium like this and they divide the placenta into incomplete divisions and they are called cotyledons so there are about 15 to 20 cotyledons in the placenta and because of these cotyledons there is that cobblestone appearance of the placenta each cotyledon consists of two or more branch tertiary villus but in this diagram due to lack of space in one cotyledon only a single branch tertiary villus is shown but remember that actually there are two or more branch tertiary villus in a single cotyledon so how does placenta works as discussed earlier the maternal blood it is poured into the intervillous spaces meanwhile the fetal blood come into these branch tertiary villus how does it come remember that there are umbilical arteries which then divide into chorionic arteries and these chorionic arteries they take the less oxygenated fetal blood and then they divide into the villus arteries here now the fetal blood is in the villus arteries and maternal blood which is oxygen rich it is in the intervillous spaces no oxygen glucose and other important substances they have to flow from the intervillous spaces into these villus arteries so from maternal blood that is in the intervillous spaces these substances they have to go into the fetal blood that is flowing within the villus arteries similarly the waste material within the fetal blood it has to move from the fetal blood into the maternal blood and how does it occur this these waste material it move from these villus arterial branches into the intervillous spaces into the maternal blood that is poured into this intervillous spaces so in this way the exchange of material between fetal and maternal blood occurs and that is the main function of placenta there are some other functions of placenta as well that we will discuss in the later lecture. Now let's focus only on to this branch tertiary villus. And here is the 3D diagram of cut section. Let's say we have cut here and here is the 3D diagram of cut section of this branch tertiary villus. Now let's suppose that this is an important substance. Let's say glucose or oxygen or any other important substance. It is right now present within the maternal blood that is poured into the intervillous spaces. This substance, let's suppose it has to move into the fetal blood within the fetal vessel it has to move. So what are the layers that it has to cross to enter into the fetal blood? So you can easily tell from this diagram that this is the first layer this and this this is the first layer that is called in situ trophoblast layer right now it is very thick so there is a thick in situ trophoblast layer then it has to pass through this layer this is the cytotrophoblast so second layer is the cytotrophoblast and then it has to pass through this mesenchymal core so third layer is the mesenchymal core of the tertiary villus and finally it has to pass through the endothelium of this fetal blood vessel so there are right now four layers through which this substance has to pass in order to reach the fetal blood 
all these layers they form what we call as placental membrane so this is the placental membrane and right now it consists of four components as enumerated here the same is true for the waste material in the fetal blood let's say here is a waste product flowing within this fetal blood vessel and it has to move uh, to the maternal blood so again how many layers it will have to cross from inner to out the endothelial of blood vessel mesenchymal core cytotrophoblast layer and the syncytiotrophoblast layer in order to come here in the in the maternal blood flowing within the intervillous spaces from this discussion you can easily infer that it is not easy for substances to exchange between the fetal and maternal blood at this time why because this membrane is very thick and that is not an efficient placenta we need a much efficient and much more robust placenta and to make this placenta robust and efficient these layer this placental membrane it should be thinned out and this is what actually happens here so what are the changes that occur in the placental membrane first of all this thick syncytiotrophoblast it will thin out it will degenerate at many places and it will become a thin film surrounding these tertiary villi as it happens a bunch of nuclei of syncytiotrophoblast they gather along with a very little cytoplasm some of these aggregates of nuclei they bud off from here and they are released into the maternal blood they are called syncytial knots there is not much clinical significance of syncytial knots because as they reach into the maternal circulation they are easily cleared up by the immune system of the mother so first change in the placental membrane what happened here is that the thick syncytiotrophoblast is converted into a thin film so in this 3d diagram let's see what happens so here as you can see that the thick syncytiotrophoblast it is converted into thin film and here is the syncytial knot so there are some syncytial knots which will which can bud off from here and reach maternal circulation then what happens that these cytotrophoblast they are also lost at many places and only few cytotrophoblast remain then thirdly what happens that mesenchymal core is also attenuated at many places right and at many places this uh, this endothelium of the fetal blood vessels it directly comes in contact with the thin syncytiotrophoblast layer now at this time this placental membrane it has become thinned out and it has become much more efficient in exchange of material so now if we see that this substance it has to pass through only few layers to reach this fetal blood now the syncytiotrophoblast layer is thin there is almost no cytotrophoblast layer the mesenchymal core is also very thin and then there is the endothelium of blood vessels so at many places the syncytiotrophoblast and endothelium of blood vessel as you can see here it comes in contact directly and these parts of placental membrane are termed as vesculosyncytial membranes so vesculosyncytial membranes are those parts of placental membrane where the endothelium of fetal blood vessels directly comes in contact with the syncytiotrophoblast of the placenta and these are the primary sites these are the major sites of exchange of material between fetal and maternal blood please note that all of the placental membrane is not termed as vesculosyncytial membrane there are certain parts there are certain foci of the placental membrane that are termed as vesculosyncytial membrane and these are the primary sites of exchange of material so after discussing the changes in placental membrane let's see another important concept there is another problem that needs to be fixed the conventional spiral arteries of maternal endometrium they are of small caliber and they offer a large resistance to flow of blood so they do not allow sufficient blood to flow into these large intervillous spaces so very less blood flow into the intervillous spaces so that's why to solve this problem the placenta does something incredible it causes the proliferation of this cytotrophoblast cells right so these cytotrophoblast cells they proliferate they invade these maternal blood vessels they invade the spiral arteries and here they undergo epithelium to endothelial transition they convert to endothelial cells 
and they invade the maternal blood vessels. They personalize the spiral arteries of the maternal endometrium in such a way that now these endometrial vessels, especially their terminal ends, now they are created by these cytotrophoblast derived specialized endothelial cells. These are not ordinary endothelial cells, these are specialized and this vessel as it is invaded, as it is remodeled, it is remodeled in such a way that now this blood vessel, it becomes of larger caliber, it offer much less resistance to blood flow and it is now become a high capacitance blood vessel. Because of this, the blood flow into the intervillous spaces, it drastically improves and this mitigates any chance of fetal hypoxia. This process is called endovascular invasion of maternal blood vessels by the cytotrophoblast. I know you might be confused about this process, so I have created a 3D animation for this. So let's watch that. So here is the maternal blood vessel, the terminal end of spiral blood vessels. And here are the proliferated cytotrophoblasts. They come, they invade this and they convert it into a larger caliber, large bore blood vessel and as this happened the lumen of this blood vessel is increased it offers less resistance to blood flow and it allows much more blood to flow into the intervillous spaces this is really a beautiful mechanism of nature i really love explaining this let's suppose that this remodeling of maternal blood vessel does not happen properly then what happens Due to improper remodeling of spiral arteries, of course, there will be much less blood reaching to the intervillous spaces. And as it happens, the fetus will not receive proper oxygen, so there will be fetal hypoxia. And this hypoxic baby, this hypoxic fetus, it will become very angry that it will start releasing certain chemicals, for example, SFLT1. And what these chemicals will do is that they will try to increase the blood pressure of the mother. They will increase the maternal blood pressure in an effort to increase the blood flow to placenta so that placenta can fetch the oxygen and other nutrients from each and every drop of blood of the maternal blood that is coming into the placenta. So what will happen that there will be increase in blood pressure and along with that, these chemicals, they may damage the glomerulus of the kidneys of mother. And this will lead to proteinuria. So, combination of these things is called preeclampsia. So, preeclampsia consists of fetal hypoxia. Along with that, there will be hypertension, increased maternal blood pressure and there will be proteinuria. And if this problem worsens, there will be CNS involvement which may lead to seizures. And this is called eclampsia so in preeclampsia there is fetal hypoxia increased blood pressure and protein urea and if there is along with the preeclampsia if there is seizures or cns involvement this is called eclampsia and that is very dangerous situation please note that preeclampsia and eclampsia is not that simple even its pathophysiology is not clearly understood this is one of the many controversial theories to explain the pathogenesis of preeclampsia and eclampsia. Well, this pathogenesis, it actually reminds me of something. You know, babies love to breastfeed. And some babies, if they are held up longer from breastfeeding, and after that long interval, when they are breastfeed, what they do is that they angrily bite the nipple of their mother. That's exactly what is happening here. As this fetus is not receiving proper nutrition, it becomes angry and it starts releasing certain chemicals. And these chemicals, they cause dysfunction in the maternal circulatory system. So this was the clinical taster of preeclampsia and eclampsia. Now let's have a 3D overview of structure of placenta. So here is the placenta and this is the maternal surface of placenta. This maternal side of placenta, it is formed by the decidua bezalis. As you have understood by now that there are the two parts of placenta. This is the maternal part or maternal plate. By the way, it is also called maternal plate because the term placenta itself means plate because it is a plate like structure. So here is the maternal part or maternal plate of the placenta that is formed by the decidua bezalis. And here is the fetal part of the placenta, which is smooth pinkish blue due to this overlying amnion. So it is formed by this amniochorion or chorionic frondosum, right? So 
here are the two umbilical arteries which carry the deoxygenated or less oxygenated blood from the fetus to this placenta with the help of this umbilical cord. So here is the umbilical cord and here these blood vessels they fan out and they form the chorionic blood vessels. The fetal part is also called chorionic plate or chorionic part and it is made up of chorionic frondosum. And by the way, you can see that this maternal part of placenta, it has this cobblestone appearance due to these uh, cotyledons. And these are the spiral arteries that are entering into each of the cotyledon. Of course, there are not just spiral arteries, there are spiral veins as well, which are not shown in this diagram. Now, let's have a cut section like this here and let's see what is inside the placenta. So here is the cross section of placenta and here you can see that these are the chorionic blood vessels and these chorionic blood vessels they divide into the villous branches or villous blood vessels and they are going into these tree like structures called tertiary branch tertiary villi. So here are the branch tertiary villi and here are the placental septa which incompletely divides this, this placenta into 15 to 25 cotyledons. Please remember that each cotyledon consists of two or more branch tertiary villi. And here is one branch tertiary villi and here as there is lack of space the other branch tertiary villi is let suppose cut over here and you can see the stump of that in this diagram. Of course, along with this umbilical artery, there are umbilical veins as well that take up the blood that comes into this intervillous spaces. It takes up the blood back into the maternal circulations. Please note that the maternal blood in the intervillous spaces, it is coming in direct contact with the chorionic villi. So this type of placenta in which the maternal blood directly comes into contact with the chorionic villi, this type of placenta is called hemochorial placenta. So human placenta is what type of placenta? It is the hemochorial placenta. Of course, there is another thing here as well and that is the outer trophoblastic or outer cytotrophoblastic shell. So here is the outer cytotrophoblastic shell. So this is the trophoblastic column here. So this column they start from the anchoring villi. So here, here is the anchoring villi. So these trophoblastic column as it starts from these anchoring villi and they fan out and they completely cover even the placental septas here. So this is the outer trophoblastic column. So this is the 3D structure of placenta. I hope that after this lecture, the structure of placenta will make much more sense to you. Thank you so much for watching this video.